El Salvador, the first nation to adopt Bitcoin as a national currency, now aims to issue a Bitcoin bond as soon as next month. Brazil's second largest city, Rio de Janeiro, plans to invest 1% of its treasury in crypto. And meanwhile, here in the US, Congress is further scrutinizing Bitcoin, holding hearings into crypto energy usage. And Swedish regulators say Europe will have to ban Bitcoin to hit the Paris climate goals. Well, joining me now to discuss this and more is top Bitcoin OG, Max Kaiser, host of the Kaiser Report and co-host of the Orange Pill podcast. Max, good to have you with us. Hi, Michelle. Great to be with you. All right, Max, you are in El Salvador at the moment. So let's start there. And uh, big plans coming from President Bukele, planning to build the world's first Bitcoin city funded initially by Bitcoin-backed bonds or volcano bonds. So tell us more about that. Sure, Michelle. So volcano bonds, as you state, it's uh, Bitcoin-backed bonds. So it's a 10-year bond. Half the money is going to go into Bitcoin, and that Bitcoin has a five-year lockup. The other half goes into infrastructure. It pays a 6.5% coupon. And uh, after five years, investors start getting back portion of their Bitcoin. So there's a lot of potential upside there. And uh, it's initially a billion dollar offer, although it looks like it's gonna be oversubscribed pretty substantially. And uh, the, the stage is set for, for up to 20 billion uh, of these bonds, uh, which would be fantastic for El Salvador. And it's termed a volcano bond because it's uh, based on the fact that a volcano is going to be providing geothermal energy to finance some of the Bitcoin mining, correct? Right, exactly, Michelle. The, um, the, the geothermal energy uh, that is piped uh, into the Bitcoin miners. I had a chance to visit one of the facilities uh, last week, and uh, it's similar to what's going on in Iceland. So Iceland converts geothermal energy into Bitcoin. And so here in El Salvador, they have access to lots and lots of geothermal energy. And President Bukele uh, teamed up with uh, Blockstream and Bitfinex and to, to put together this bond. And also Bank to the Future is going to be involved. And starting next month, uh, they'll be taking orders for these bonds. But yes, you're absolutely correct. It's the geothermal energy powers the bitcoin miners and 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 that's the core asset and and what's the timeline on that on getting that mining operation up and running well uh the bonds uh, will be uh ready to go uh, in february uh there's already uh geothermal facilities up and running right now so they've got they've All got right. the geothermal energy happening and they'll be building they'll be building that out so there's plenty of room to keep building that out and uh, it's a proven model. They've got proof of concept. And um, there's a big market for these bonds. You're saying oversubscribed at the moment? Well, yeah, that, that's my understanding. You know, I've been working diligently myself and trying to help raise money for these bonds. As you know, I'm a former stockbroker on Wall Street. I spent my entire professional career selling securities. So I know uh, all about stocks and bonds and how to sell them. And um, there's indications of interest for over a billion dollars in these bonds. So uh, we, we think that the offer is going to go really, really well. All right. Six and a half percent. Very attractive. And we get what Bukele is trying to do here. But the adoption of Bitcoin for El Salvador has arguably so far not alleviated the country's economic problems. Currently having a bit of a sovereign debt crisis, the dollar denominated debt is rapidly losing value, becoming more distressed. There's also the fact that the acquisition of about $71 million worth of Bitcoins last year has so far lost the country money. And Moody downgraded the country's credit rating to uh, CAA1, which reflects a very, very high risk of default on its debt. So, so far, this introduction of Bitcoin into El Salvador's treasury has only increased the country's risk profile, not paying off economically so far. So, Max, okay, well, when uh -huh. does this start to pay off? What is the timeline that it's projected for all of this to start make sense and for vindication to be there for El Salvador? 
Right. Well, as you know, Moody uh, is a lagging indicator. They tend to be six to 12 months behind the curve. Uh, what they're not seeing is that the country's got 10% plus growth this year in GDP. They're set to do 20% uh, next year GDP growth. Uh, the boom in tourism is substantial. It's the only country in the region that had an increase in tourism dollars last year. Uh, they, they booked uh, over a billion in tourist dollars during La BitConf, which was a Bitcoin conference. Um, so um, that's, uh, I think, six to 12 months down the road, you're going to see rating agencies have to reverse themselves because they're not discounting what's actually happening now uh, in terms of growth for the country. And um, this is the beginning, I think, of a regional uh, explosion in Bitcoin adoption and Bitcoin mining. And this is the, the goal here is to be the Singapore of Latin America. Uh, as this industry spills out over into the five countries that make Central America, um, you're going to find that El Salvador is the hub for all this banking going on. So if you put the populations of the five countries together, it's about 65 million, uh, potentially $1 trillion in economic activity, uh, all going through El Salvador's uh, new finance sector. So right. uh, that's, that's, that's why people are flocking here. That's why uh, people are immigrating here. That's why Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert are seeking citizenship here, uh, because this is like a startup nation. This is uh, the fat, one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, it's got one of the most uh, visionary progressive presidents in the world. And uh, quite frankly, in the US, things are looking quite dire. You've got infant mortality up life expectancy down, you've got deaths of despair skyrocketing with overdoses and suicides, and it's become a dysfunctional mess. So a lot of people in America and Canada and the other countries are saying, you know what, we're going to leave the, the dying legacy banking system and we're going to move to El Salvador where they've got a Bitcoin standard, a visionary leadership in place and the potential for enormous upside. Look, certainly visionary leadership and potential for enormous upside, as you say. But focusing back on these volcano bonds, at what price does Bitcoin have to be for those bonds to pay off and be profitable for El Salvador, given you've got that six and a half percent interest payment and the fact that an issuance of a billion dollars is out there to pay half a million, uh, 500 million for infrastructure and 500 million for, for Bitcoin. So where does Bitcoin need to be for that proposition to make sense price-wise? Uh, it doesn't have to be anywhere than where it is right now because the dividend's covered from taxation. So that's uh, where the 6.5% uh, coupon comes from. Uh, the kicker is on the 500 million that's going to be invested in Bitcoin that is, has a five-year lockup. And then uh, looking forward, uh, over any five-year stretch of time uh, since Bitcoin's inception, you have remarkable upside. Uh, so investors are able to participate in that uh, as well. But for the average bond investor out there, they're not seeing anything over 2% on a 10-year right. note. And so 6.5% is very attractive. We know from MicroStrategy, uh, Michael Saylor's company, he was able to sell uh, billions of, of paper uh, essentially to buy Bitcoin, offering roughly six and an eighth, I believe, was the coupon on that bond. Uh, and that was quickly oversubscribed. So the market around the world of the $100 trillion, Michelle, in investable assets around the world, there's a real need to get exposure to Bitcoin. As the biggest money managers in the world, like Bill Miller, uh, Ray Dalio, Paul Tudor Jones, they're all now pointing to Bitcoin as the place to be as inflation rages, yeah. uh, Paul Tudor Jones calling Bitcoin the fastest horse in the race. So they want to get Bitcoin exposure. Here they're getting 6.5% while they wait for uh, the, the typical cycles that the price is known for. Uh, and so they get the best of both worlds. You know, you're getting nice yield, current dividend, uh, and you get the upside as well. So that's what makes this bond so attractive. And that's why people are uh, lining up to uh, buy it. And you get the primary returned after 10 years, correct? Yeah. All right. So where is your price projection for Bitcoin in a decade's time, in 10 years' time, Max? Well, in fiat times, it's going to infinity because all in fiat... In 10 years' time? In, all, in, in, in 10 years' time. 
uh, within 10 years, uh, mo most of the fiat money in the world today is going to be worthless because we're at a point now where the uh, printing of these of, of fiat by the major central banks, whether it's the Fed, the ECB, Bank of England, uh, Bank of Japan, has gone into hyperbolic uh, kind of mania. And that's, that's all, that's all going to Venezuela. In other words, Venezuela is the, uh, the, the, the role model for countries like the United States and others who are just hyperbolically printing uh, absolutely out of control. Uh, so it, Bitcoin in those terms is uh, l literally has an infinite price target. All right, I'm gonna rewind and focus on what you said there. Clearly, we are seeing unprecedented money printing stimulus, not just here in the US, around the world here in the US, we do have inflation at a 40 year high, but you're trying to tell me that you believe that in 10 years time, we will see the end of fiat currency in a decade's time? Well, I'd rather be uh, a couple of years too early than one day too late. What we know, uh, Michelle, is that over 300 years, not a single fiat money has escaped insolvency and losing either 100% or 99% of its value. That's the track record fiat money has for the past 300 years. None have escaped going to zero. So why, why would you bet that suddenly that 300 year trend is going to somehow change course? Uh, and I think over the next 10 years, as you see uh, these economies, these major economies like the US and China, um, who are carrying debt loads 300% to GDP, uh, suddenly hit, hit the, 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 the breakers and they, they're gonna just try to print their way out of all this. And so th we're talking about a, a fiat money apocalypse. Look, to your point, uh, mankind has debased every fiat currency since uh, the beginning of fiat currencies. I mean, there was a time when the Portuguese Escudo used to be the global reserve currency. So I hear that trend and it makes sense on a fundamental level but it's your timeline that I'm somewhat questioning here. <laughs> well, like I said, it's, I'd rather be uh, cautious and load up on as much Bitcoin as I possibly can now and not try to uh, play games on the timing side. What I do know for sure is that these fiat money, uh, all this currency is going to go to zero. You know, the, re the reason why Bitcoin is already in the tens of thousand dollars per coin is that um, all of the major fiat money in the world is right now in a hyperinflationary collapse against Bitcoin. That's already happening right now. The dollar, the yen, yuan, they're all in a hyperinflationary collapse against Bitcoin right now. And that trend is gonna continue. Uh, and yet we haven't seen that reflected so far in the price of Bitcoin. Yes, considering... well, how do you think you got to Bitcoin at uh, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 a coin? It's well, I mean, the, the, the recent money, decline. The fiat money is collapsing in, in, in a hyperinflationary collapse. The purchasing power of the fiat money in, versus Bitcoin is collapsing. Um, and that's, what, that's why the price of Bitcoin is where it's at today. It's discounting the fact that paper money is already collapsing right now versus Bitcoin. And when a country like El Salvador makes Bitcoin legal tender, it means now you've got a country that's got the ability to uh, give its citizens unconfiscatable wealth, uncensorable wealth, uh, and divorce itself from the fiat money world, the IMF and these other institutions that have been uh, really uh, draconian in their um, in, in their um, application of, of, of loan um, extractions and everything that comes with it. And right. um, so this is the beginning of a new era and that's gonna spread. So when you have the domino effect and you have this region like Argentina is now uh, going down the path of hyper Bitcoinization, all this, these countries in Africa are becoming hyper Bitcoinized. So when that hyper Bitcoinization wave starts to go global, uh, that puts enormous pressure on the dollar. On the geopolitical front, you've now got Russia, China, Iran, they're dumping the dollar, uh, yeah. right? So there's nobody supporting the dollar on those, in, in those countries. So the dollar's at a genuine risk of, of collapsing outright here. And, uh, I, and 10 years is a long time in, in geopolitical terms. And when you've got something like Bitcoin, who's been appreciating at over 100% a year for more than 11 years, it's been the best performing asset in 11 years, and that's set to continue for the next 10, 20 years. Uh, when you add all that together, you come up with an enormously higher price for Bitcoin. You, you see big, uh, paper money trading down to levels like Venezuela, 
And, and you see a different world where uh, those that were in charge of the global financial system are no longer in charge. So in 10 years time, you're seeing the collapse of the dollar being replaced globally by a Bitcoin standard Bitcoin as the global reserve currency or means of exchange. Well, yeah, I think a good example would be the internet. You know, back in the 1990s, I started, a, I was part of the dot-com industry at that time. And within a very, in 1997, Michelle, it, it was believed that the internet was a fad. And Paul, Paul Krugman, Krugman yeah. at the New York Times wrote a story saying, oh, this thing won't last. And uh, I was in Hollywood at the time and executives were embarrassed to put an email address on their business cards because they thought it looked too geeky. Uh, but then you had that hockey stick moment and now the internet is ubiquitous. And that yeah. happened very, very quickly. Uh, similarly, Bitcoin is like a marriage between gold and a messaging app. And so it has that networking effect and we're getting into that hockey stick moment where adoption goes from approximately 200 million people using Bitcoin today to 2 billion people using Bitcoin within the next year or two. That crowds out uh, the legacy system, the fiat money system and the fiat money banks. And that happens very, very quickly because it is uh, technology and it's technology that can spread hyperbolically. And, and so um, that's why I'm pretty aggressive on my timeline. Yeah, no, all right. Well, I always appreciate you actually giving specifics. That's always a bold move and it's appreciated. I wanna circle back on the exact developments in El Salvador, specifically the move to use Bitcoin as legal tender because we're getting some conflicting reports on how the people in El Salvador are actually responding to this idea. There are some reports of protests, uh, there are surveys by news agencies like Reuters indicating that there's broad dissatisfaction with the move. Local media calling foreign Bitcoin proponents uh, economic hitmen. But then again, at the same time, you've got Chivo, El Salvador's official Bitcoin wallet, reportedly managing to onboard 4 million users through a partnership with Netkey. And keeping in mind that the total population of El Salvador is 6.8 million. 4 million have wallets. It certainly seems like it's gaining traction to me. So you tell us, how is it being received? Which reports are accurate here? It, well, the, it, the reception of Bitcoin is uh, very, very strong. As you point out, the, the, the number of people who have Bitcoin wallets now exceeds the number of people who have banks in total, bank accounts. So uh, the total, pe the number of people with bank accounts in El Salvador is less than the number of people with Bitcoin wallets. So you've, that's the process of banking the unbanked. And that's part of the magic of Bitcoin, is that if you're a pupusa seller and you're on the roadside in El Zante uh, and you're not uh, eligible to get a bank account, uh, with Bitcoin, you effectively have a bank on your phone. You can accept payments and you can save in Bitcoin which is a fantastic savings vehicle. And that message is getting out to people all over the country. And the opposition is, let's, let's be honest here. I mean, the Central America has always been a place, it's been America's playground for decades in terms of America's colonial interests. There's been 15 coups in this region orchestrated by the United States. And they've always used the, the cheap labor and the cheap commodity prices uh, to the advantage of the U.S. So there's been a bit of a, uh, uh, a, a colonial playland, as I said. So the idea now that they're going to lose this, the U.S. is going to lose these countries because they become independent with Bitcoin. It's non, it's unconfiscatable, uncensorable money. Um, they're going to pull out their bag of tricks. You mentioned the phrase uh, economic hitmen. That, that phrase was applied directly to me in a, in a, in a opposition newspaper, uh, which is ironic because I am actually quite familiar with John Perkins who wrote the book, An Economic Hitman. And what he describes are the carpetbaggers and the charlatans from the CIA who come down here and set up shop and uh, threaten uh, presidents, sitting presidents on behalf of US corporations. And that's of course the exact opposite of what Bitcoin allows, people to get individual sovereignty. It's, it's unconfiscatable wealth. So um, that on its face is completely erroneous and just uh, rhetorical laziness and intellectual and journalistic malpractice. Uh, but as you also mentioned, uh, even this very weak opposition is very tiny. 
It's laughably small. It's literally okay. uh, three guys, you know, showing up with a placard uh, and, and a pupusa, and that's it. it that's, the, the, the president is extremely uh, popular, and uh, Bitcoin is seen as a way out from the U.S. dollar hegemony, and most importantly, the IMF. You know, the IMF yeah. is always applying the screws to countries like El Salvador, and these volcano bonds are a way to pay off the IMF, get rid of the IMF, get rid of all external debt, and to be, and to be completely sovereign. The, the, the U.S. doesn't like that idea. Uh, but they're going to have to live with it because there's no, there's nothing that's going to stop it now. All right. Well, part of the mass adoption that we have seen uh, is due to the government airdropping thirty dollars worth of Bitcoin to every uh, Salvadoran uh, wallet account holder on on Shivo. So they're certainly encouraging that. Are you actually seeing people using it as legal tender, using it to transact, spending it to buy a, a cup of coffee, for example? Well, here on Bitcoin Beach in El Zante, I don't see anything but Bitcoin. So regular daily transactions being made with Bitcoin. That's it. It's, this, it's the currency of El Zante. Well, well, then how can you reconcile its use as a daily currency with this idea of massive price appreciation? Why use your Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee if it is going to go to beyond infinity in 10 years time, or let's go with your annual prediction. I believe you say it's going to hit 220,000 by the end of this year. Why buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin rather than not hold it if it's expected to have this huge upside on the price? Does it not then de facto become a store of value? I mean, well, why use it as, as a transactional means? I have a checking account and I have a savings account. And uh, in my savings, I have a lot of Bitcoin. In my day-to-day -day use, I have in my petty cash, you know, I use Bitcoin. So it's already made, it's, it's established itself as a store of value. And now it's established itself as a medium of exchange. And in an area like this, it's becoming a unit of account. Uh, so that model we're going to see uh, happening all over the world. But, but you know, your dollars don't have these massive appreciations over or downside. But let's go with the appreciation scenario over a relatively short uh, period of time. My question yeah. is, how can I, I see it as a store of value asset, 100 percent. But how can you reconcile its use as a daily currency, knowing that you're going to give up on this massive upside potential with the price appreciation forecasting, uh, forecasting it as you do? Well, thank, thank goodness uh, the economy is growing so fast and the opportunities are so plentiful. People are making uh, more money than they have in decades. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, cyclical and uh, virtuous cycle. Uh, the more you spread it around, uh, you know the way the story of, of money, uh, you spread it around and it feeds uh, entrepreneurialism and it feeds uh, other people to uh, get, in, get into the small businesses that they are interested in getting into. And so it becomes a self-feeding virtuous cycle. So uh, people are going to be making more money and they're going to be saving more money the more that they enter this circular economy of Bitcoin. It's not a stagnant situation. The economy is growing and it's growing because of Bitcoin. So if I spend a little Bitcoin today and I'm helping somebody else grow their business and their business get bigger, it's like Tahini's restaurant in Canada. Tahini's restaurant is, uh, they accept Bitcoin, they use Bitcoin, it's a Bitcoin in their savings account. And they're, they're now one of the fastest growing restaurant chains in Canada. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all about growth, Michelle, and the growth that comes with Bitcoin is fueling uh, all kinds of entrepreneurial and economic activity. That's what's pulling the entrepreneurs here. That's what's pulling the expatriates here. That's what's pulling the capital here. So it's all, it's all kind of uh, moving in that direction. So you don't see any kind of inherent conflict, is what you're telling me, between the massive upside potential uh, for Bitcoin as a store of value and as a hedge against fiat debasement and the daily transaction use case. You're saying well, those I mean, can go I, hand I'll in hand. I'll give you an idea. For example, on my way in, um, the local coffee seller was saying, you know, today for people just showing up, we'll give you a 75% discount if you pay in Bitcoin. All right. I can see why they would want the Bitcoin. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, okay. All right. So look, I hear your point there. Um, and you mentioned that we're seeing Argentina also 
a move in the Bitcoin direction, seeing adoption in South America at large, uh, Rio de Janeiro planning to invest 1% of its treasury into crypto, as you touched on, also seeing increased adoption in Africa. So which country do you think could be next here in adopting Bitcoin as legal tender? Yeah, well, any, the, any number of countries uh, would, could, could be next. Um, you know, uh, Bukele is on a is on a foreign trip today, and he's meeting with the head Turkey. of Turkey. You know, so <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it could be a lot of interesting conversation there. But clearly, in this region, um, it could be a country like Guatemala or some some in Latin America yeah. could be next. Um, it's you know, we all I've been saying for six or seven years now that we would see a country make Bitcoin legal tender. And this would set off a global kind of what I call hash war or hash race. Countries kind of competing with each other to adopt Bitcoin and hoard Bitcoin. And this is the most, uh, more natural or likely outcome than this idea of countries banning Bitcoin. So uh, banning Bitcoin never works. But what happens is countries instead, they enter into this global frenzy to, to accumulate Bitcoin and to legalize Bitcoin. And so we're seeing that play out. Uh, and, and so we're definitely seeing it in this region. So you, you can almost throw a dart in this, in this region and, and to pick which one will be next. I think ultimately they all go, uh, the dominoes will fall. Um, and, and we're seeing a tremendous activity in, in Africa as well, which is gonna be huge. And um, so it's, it's a bit of a guessing game. I mean, I could, I could guess, I don't have Go any, ahead. I don't have <laughs> You're a good any, guesser, you've been a good guesser so far. Um, you know, I mean, I'll say, um, what will I say? Um, Guatemala. Guatemala could be no, next. I'm getting to waved adopt. up. Central, Central America, just so that you know for a fact. <laughs> yeah. I know. Okay. I know for a fact that I, I actually do know the next country to tell you the truth, but I'm not going to say who it is. But it's in Central Well, America. you have some inside information, that's, that's which you're thing. not going to share with that, us. That, that, I, I, that, that's it. So I can't really guess because I, I actually know the answer, but I can't say the answer because it's not, it's not yet uh, widely under, uh, dispersed, this, this, this information. So being okay. a banker for many years, you know, the way it goes, uh, this is sometimes information, you know, is, is not ready to be uh, shared. It's not ready to be Look, shared. I'm not the person who's going to be sharing that information, but it's coming soon. I can respect that, but can I take away from what you're telling me that another country in, in South America is going to make Bitcoin legal tender by the end of 2022? Yes. All right. And you're very confident with that uh, position. I am very confident in that position. I, uh, uh, yes, I'm very confident. And then to your point, then the whole FOMO kicks in, game yes. theory kicks in and the dominoes start to fall. What, what is it going to take for um, a G7 country to get on board? Well, it's, uh, you know, these are the legacy countries and they are wealth extractors. You know, they're, they're the ones that are the big losers in all of this. So they're the, to, you know, you can understand why they would not be on the first wave of countries to make adoption of Bitcoin. So um, it's, um, it's hard to say which one eventually will crack, but I, I, I think it's safe to say that eventually one of them will crack. As you point out, there is game theory at play. And um, as the fiat money world starts to crumble, um, it's, the, the co collusion, you could call it, you know, Nomi Prince wrote a great book called Collusion about central bank collusion. And the, the G7 central banks really work together. They're not competing with each other. They tend to coordinate their activities around the world. And they do so uh, because they extract enormous economies of scale from being the money printers and the setters of interest rates. And they do so on behalf of their client banks. And so people point to that, have been for many years, as an inherently corrupt system. And I'm not saying anything new there. But at some point, uh, one of these banks is going to break ranks and say, you know what, we're just going to actually start buying Bitcoin and uh, to, we want to be the first to do so because we think that there's greater upside in doing that than playing this game with the other banks. And so which one of those banks will break ranks? It's hard to say, but I, I think it's, it's a good bet that one of them will.